Okay. I just wanted to revisit one or two things we talked about last time um, as a reminder. So we introduced a couple of principles to you last time to help you think about um, common materials, binary semiconductors and materials in general. Um, and in particular, we're really interested in band gaps um, and band widths. Right, so we showed this example of sodium chloride, zinc sulfide, zinc telluride, and said that you know you can derive, you can make a guess as to the size of the band gap um, based on the ionization energy and the electron affinity of the atoms involved. Okay, so sodium chloride has a huge band gap because the ionization energy and electron affinity of the elements are very different. Um, zinc telluride and zinc sulfide. You know, the conduction band is made up of empty uh, zinc 4S combinations. The valence band is made up of filled sulfur and tellurium uh, P orbital combinations. And, you know, those are um, the, the valence orbitals of the element, just like you would expect would be involved in the bonding and the differences in uh, the 4S combinations for the zinc sulfide and zinc telluride aren't that great. They are meaningfully different. You saw we shared a chart with you last time. Um, there's a link to that chart if you want to download a PDF of it on the website. But those bands are very similar um, in energy um, because they're made of the same kinds of orbitals. Now, the tellurium and the sulfur, very different. You get a big shift in, in terms of their energy, and that leads to a difference in the band gap. Okay, so that's one of the reasons the band gap is different. So you look at any given material, you think about its electron affinities, ionization energies, and you can guess what the band gaps are relative to other similar kinds of materials. The other very important principle we talked about is band width. So the width of these bands, remember these plots are energies versus density of states. Density of states is the number of levels you find in a given interval of energy, and then it's in usually expressed in um, uh, per unit volume. Uh, and so these two different levels have different widths associated with them in the energy axis. That also changes their density of states, although it's not very well diagrammed here. Um, what causes the width? The width tells you something about the bonding in the material. Um, we looked at this example of magnesium metal to try and illustrate that. Uh, 3P band, 3S band here, um, and then the 2P, 2S, and 1S bands, you notice that they have very different widths, right? This is the vertical direction in energy. That width tells you about the degree to which those orbitals make bonds. And of course, 1S and 2S and 2P are core levels. They don't make bonds. Um, 3S and 3P do make bonds, and that leads to a breadth in terms of their energy. So the linear combinations of those orbitals give you a spread in energy. If you force the atoms on top of each other, the spread in energy becomes larger. If you stretch the crystal, the spread in energy becomes smaller. And in this particular case, when you're dealing with magnesium, you know, the, the electron configuration of the atom has a filled 3s orbital and an empty 3p orbital. So if there were no bonding in magnesium metal, there'd be no bandwidth and you wouldn't have a metal at all. You'd have a semiconductor. You get a metal in this case because the 3s and the 3p bands overlap. The overlap happens because of the broadening in energy caused by bonding. Um, and the result is that you get a continuous band made up of a mixture of 3P and 3S that's partially filled. And the partial filling, you can see um, by this dashed line, which denotes the energy level of a 50% probability of occupation, that's the Fermi energy, and it falls in the middle of the band. And when you get that situation, you get a uh, conducting material because there are lots of energy levels nearby for an electron to hop into to move from one atom to the next. 
we also mentioned transition metals. They have this combination of 4S and 3D, and that combination uh, leads to some overlap and fills to different degrees depending upon the number of uh, electrons in the transition metal you're talking about. And so um, it gives rise to this very sort of simple behavior that's consistent across the transition metal series. Okay, so bandwidth is a very important concept because it tells us about uh, orbital overlap. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about that later. Um, the other principle we need to talk about is uh, Coulomb forces, okay? So in addition to orbital overlap today, we're gonna to talk about um, Coulomb forces and um, how charges and crystals uh, respond to their, their environment. So just a reminder here, I've shown you Coulomb's law in the upper left that shows the energy for separating two charges um, by some distance r. Um, and it's modified by something called the dielectric constant of the medium. Okay, and this is sort of like a screening constant, or you know, if you have two charges in a medium where there's a high dielectric constant, you get a different energy versus one that has a low dielectric constant. So in an ionic solid, this energy is very, very important, okay? Because you have a mixture of cations and anions that are all separated by the bond distances there, and that leads to huge uh, energies uh, for the crystal, okay? Pulling a crystal of, of ions apart into gas phase ions is very, very energetically costly. Um, as I mentioned, the dielectric constant is the a measure of some medium's ability to reduce the uh, potential energy to separate charges or to reduce the electric field um, between charges. And it turns out dielectric constant is really an interesting thing. It's not actually a constant. Um, it's approximated as a constant, uh, uh, but in fact, there are motions in crystals and in glasses and in gases um, that influence charge also, or react in response to charge separation. And that uh, uh, motion, like the polarizability of electron clouds or the diffusion of atoms uh, or ions or the orientation of a molecule in its dipole, all of those features will change the energy for separating charge in that medium. So um, it's very helpful to be reminded about something called capacitance uh, here when thinking about this principle. So shown in the upper right is a parallel plate capacitor and I've shown a certain charge uh, density in that plate as positive and negative charges. Um, and the electric field that you get uh, dropped across that depends upon that charge density divided by the permittivity or, uh, of the, or the dielectric uh, of the medium between the two charges. This electric field is also related to voltage. If you don't wanna talk about charge density, you can talk about uh, voltage and, di and distance. So, um, you know, you can have vacuum between two parallel plates or you can have something else like air. Air is approximately like vacuum. Um, there are a variety of other things you could put in there that modulate the uh, charge density and the voltage that can um, uh, be accumulated there. You often hear about the, um, the K value. The K value is basically just a modifier. So you take the dielectric constant of of the gas phase and mod modify it by some factor uh, as opposed to reporting a whole new dielectric constant for a medium. So K is um, uh, um, just a sort of different way of talking about dielectric constant. So the effective field drop that you get uh, across this capacitor is the one for um, uh, you know without the medium and then Sorry, my phone is buzzing off here. And then the one modified by polarization of that medium. Okay, so we're gonna talk quite a bit about um, polarization or, or at least introduce the idea. Um, the polarization uh, affects the electric field that's present there. The larger the polarization, the smaller the resultant electric field. All right, 
So a little bit of confusion here. The E's in this diagram are about electric field. This E over here and then subsequent slides is going to be about energy. Okay, so I've sort of mixed, I need a new symbol here. All right, so let's talk about that just a little bit more. Um, so I mentioned there are different types of polarization. You know, you can take a nucleus, or sorry, a, an atom, and it's surrounding electron cloud and polarize it. Okay, you put it into a field and the electrons will move and the nucleus will move. And the motion of those electrons and the nuclei um, uh, uh, contributes to the polarizability of the solid. So electronic polarization is sort of a standard thing. And you might imagine that um, elements with a lot of electrons uh, tend to do this pretty well. There's also atomic polarization. And this is where atoms in the crystal are moving, but they're not actually flowing. They just sort of move off of their preferred crystallographic uh, positions. So um, you know, you'll probably hear a lot about the lead halide perovskites. The lead halide perovskites are famous for having very high polariz polarizability. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the motion of the lead atom in the octahedron. So you could imagine this is a lead and these are a bunch of halides. The motion of that lead atom contributes atomic polarization uh, uh, to the dielectric properties of the lead halide perovskites. Another is dipolar polarization. So you can think about a crystal of water um, and the orientation of the dipoles of the water molecules. And when you polarize a crystal of water, the dipoles will move in response to that electric field. And that motion of the molecule leads to kind of a rearrangement of the atoms in the crystal. Um, and it has a different kind of response function or force associated with then the atomic polarization. Although these are uh, sort of similar, they tend to happen at different frequencies as we'll see. Um, and then the last thing is something called space charge polarization. This is really just diffusion of ions within a solid. So most solids, um, you know, many solids, uh, the ions undergo diffusion. Um, the lead halide perovskites are famous for this, you know, bromide or uh, the counter ion. Uh, will diffuse across the crystal in response to a voltage. And the diffusion acts to counter that voltage. Okay, so the polarization of the crystal and the motion of the ions acts to reduce the energy of the system and oppose the electric field that's being applied to the system. Okay, so there are all these types of motions of electrons, of atoms, of molecules, and of ions all of which contribute to the dielectric properties and affect the Coulomb potential that you have in a solid. All right, so let's just take a look at dielectric potentials to give you a sense. Things like wax and benzene, they have a higher dielectric constant than uh, vacuum, which is one by definition. Uh, and then, you know, as you go to more polar solvents like THF or ammonia, that dielectric constant goes way up. I think water is 80. I don't, oh, there it is. Water, acetonitrile, DMF. Um, you have uh, a form amide. That's a real nice solvent. Dielectric constant of 100. Um, that's a huge difference in the energy of charge separation. You know, if you're an organic chemist and you're trying to make a reaction go, um, and the reaction involves charged intermediates, you use a higher dielectric medium that will stabilize the generation of separated charges and lower the energy of a reaction pathway uh, that requires charge separation. So dielectric constant of the solvent, you're very, probably very familiar with. Solids also have dielectric properties um, to consider. Uh, heavy elements like hafnium and titanium and lead, you know, you're gonna see higher dielectric constants uh, in part because of the electronic polarization that I mentioned. Um, and then other very interesting materials like strontium titanate and barium titanate, you actually get atomic motion within the crystal um, uh, or calcium copper titanate that gives you enormous dielectric constants. It's really interesting to think about um, the difference between these numbers. You know, here you've got 10,000 versus 100. Of course, you're familiar with the idea that formamide is a far more 
uh, polarizable medium um, than benzene or hexane or something like that. But think about this, another factor of 100 uh, is possible with materials like this or factors of you know, 1,000 or more. So dielectric properties of solids are really an interesting topic. Very few people have devote themselves to that uh, uh, in their research. Um, you know, you can take a, uh, you can measure the polarization of material or the potential of a material um, as a function of an applied electric field. Um, and you'll see different behavior depending upon the, the polarization mechanism that's at play in the material. Okay, so uh, if you just take a, a, a stable crystal where there's no diffusion of ions, there's no um, uh, large atomic uh, motions within the crystal or reorientations of dipoles, um, typically you'll see a very linear kind of a polarization in response to an applied electric field. If you have something like a crystal of water where units of the material move uh, in concert, then you can get different response functions, you know, very, very steep response functions and then much slower response functions. Notice this one is kind of like this one up here. So this might be atomic polarization, whereas this one is a, um, sorry, electronic polarization where this is a dipolar kind of a motion of the water molecule. And then there are very interesting materials called ferroelectrics. Uh, ferroelectrics are materials where one of the elements of the crystal can move to a different equilibrium position, okay, uh, in response to an applied field. So you can take something like this lead uh, titanium or uh, zirconium oxide perovskite crystal here, and the high symmetry position for that atom and the crystal sits in the middle of this octahedron uh, of oxygen atoms. Um, but that central atom can actually move off center um, and the crystal will slightly elongate. Now, so this uh, titanium or, zir or zirconium atom is no longer in the middle of the octahedron. Um, and in fact, if you change the polarization, it'll jump to the other side. And the position that it's jumped to per turns out to be a stable position in that crystal. If you look at the ferro ferroelectric polarization curve shown here on the left, you'll see that there's a, um, uh, a motion, uh, sorry, uh, an electronic polarization, and then all of a sudden a big change and then an electronic polarization. And on the reverse sweep, you'll actually go past the point where that polarization happened. And that's because there's a barrier to this motion of the titanium from this equilibrium position to that equilibrium position. Okay, so it's got a hop from one side to the other. There's a barrier to doing that. Um, and it prefers one of those orientations uh, over the other one, um, uh, depending upon the position of that field. It turns out that this kind of material can be used to make random access memory. So if you're trying to make a little bit on a memory chip that's, that stores a charge and the, the magnitude of the charge is the one or the zero or the minus one, um, you can polarize that crystal uh, using a voltage, the atoms will move and they'll stay there. And so you come back and read the voltage uh, and it'll tell you that polarization. Okay, so this sort of reluctance to make the jump from one position to the next that you see by this um, square right here turns out to be very, very useful. All right, so polarization in crystals is a really big uh, topic. Uh, ferroelectrics are really powerful. Um, you know, dielectric media for transistors and computer chip design, a very big deal. Um, and dielectric properties of solids dictate a lot of their optical characteristics as well. Okay, so you're going to hear a lot about dielectric constant um, if you're working in, in material science. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot I had this one here too. So <clears throat> turns out that the dielectric constant uh, is not a constant, as I said, but it actually is um, a property that responds to the frequency of polarization as well. Okay, and so um, here on the right axis, I have plotted the frequency in Hertz. So this is high frequency on the right, here's low frequency on the left. And the vertical axis is actually the di dielectric 
uh, constant of the medium. Now, if you measure the frequency response of the dielectric, you get different properties. Okay, so uh, remember on the previous slide, here I showed you that this is a cycle, it's a sweep that's happening. And you could imagine doing this at different frequencies. You could cycle that very quickly or cycle it very slowly. And depending upon whether you move quickly or slowly, you will see uh, different responses. So um, here actually is that response function now uh, plotted in this way as two different components. Okay, so you can, if you take a uh, measure the frequency response of a solid, you can fit the data and decompose it uh, into two different components here. Um, one of which is the, um, uh, an imaginary component and one of which is a real component. And the difference between these, you're gonna see this type of thing in the future, I promise, not just for dielectric, um, but this is a way to analyze resonances um, in a material. It's, you can think about uh, springs and their motion in this way. Um, the blue curve, which represents the imaginary component, is actually uh, ionization or, sorry, uh, ion diffusion within the crystal. It's a, it's a sort of, um, uh, uh, it's a type of motion that continues. Um, the, these types of motions here, the dipolar motion, the stretching or the um, electronic polarizability of a nucleus, those things have a certain characteristic uh, type of a frequency. Okay, you can only go so far uh, with these. They have a well-defined um, resonant type of response, whereas this one is sort of mushier. And so if you switch the frequency, um, you know, you'll find these various uh, uh, sorts of shapes here. Um, as you move toward high frequency, uh, eventually all of these things converge on one, which is um, sort of unresponsive. It's basically the permittivity of vacuum. Um, but at lower frequency, you can get large polarization. So the ionic motion goes way up at low frequency. Things like dipolar motions are... Um, uh, are only really active at low frequency, whereas these electronic ones, they're active at very high frequencies, okay? And so this is a, a function of the sort of mobility um, of the, the components that are undergoing polarization. Uh, so dielectric constant is not a constant. It is a, has a spectrum of response depending upon the frequency of the polarization um, that's applied. Uh, and can tell you all kinds of very interesting things about the solid. What are the components like? How do they move? Do ions diffuse? Okay, so if you really want to dig into this sort of thing, um, you need to get involved in measuring the uh, frequency dependence of that dielectric constant. Um, interesting tidbit, you know, at very high frequencies, basically the electrons in the crystal, you know, the, at very, very high frequencies, the atoms cannot move. Molecules cannot rotate, the bonds cannot stretch, and in fact, the electrons cannot respond. Okay, so really, really high frequencies, the dielectric of that medium is insensitive um, and doesn't respond, um, which is why the constant approach is one. Um, the result is that X rays, which have very, very high frequencies, uh, are not easily um, modified by the, the dielectric medium. Um, and this makes it difficult to design X-ray lenses, which is kind of a very interesting thing. Uh, so, you know, a lens basically takes advantage of the dielectric properties of that medium of the, at the frequency of light that's coming in. And the difference in the dielectric constant allows the uh, material to bend that light. Uh, and so X-rays, because they're high frequency, are not susceptible to that. All right. So... Let's talk a little bit about how that affects uh, bonding in crystals. Um, and so, you know, there's this thing called the Madelung potential, which is, a, a, it's an energy associated with the Coulomb force in a crystal, okay? Um, and so you can see the energy for the, the, uh, the Madelung potential energy plotted here on the left. Um, and it looks a lot like Coulomb's law, but there's this modifier here called the Madelung constant. This modifier um, actually uh, uh, considers all of the nearest neighbors in that crystal 
um, and how each one of those Coulomb forces contributes to the entire Coulomb force, okay? So this diagram over here on the right shows a rock salt crystal structure. And you'll notice all the atoms have different uh, labels on them. This zero is the central atom in our analysis. And then you can go around uh, away from that zero and count the number of atoms that are present there. So you can see there are six atoms that are uh, first nearest neighbors. Um, and then there are 12 atoms that are second nearest neighbors uh, and so on and so forth. So if you wanted to calculate the energy, the Coulomb energy of pulling this atom out of the crystal, you have to consider all of those various interactions. Okay, now they are different bond distances away. Um, and so while this one is just six for the, near, the first nearest neighbor, this second one is root two modified by root two to account for the fact that it's further away. Okay, and this one's root three to account for the fact that it's even further than that. Okay, so this, this factor here, the Mandelung constant, considers the symmetry of the crystal uh, and counts the number of Coulomb interactions um, that are relevant. Okay, and so for different crystals, you get different Madelung uh, constants. So like rock salt is 1.75, verdsite and sphalerite, which are um, two different uh, crystal structures for binary uh, materials like sodium chloride. But in this case, one of them is, this one is hexagonal. This is a cubic structure. Um, the atoms in these kinds of crystals are tetrahedrally coordinated, whereas in a rock salt, everybody's octahedrally coordinated. Um, and you can see as you go from rock salt towards sphalerite, the Madelung potential, uh, the Madelung constant goes down. Okay, now if you take a series of binary materials, cadmium oxide, sulfide, selenide, and telluride, um, these materials can take on a rock salt crystal structure. They can also take on a wordsite or a sphalerite crystal structure. These again are the tetrahedrally coordinated uh, atoms, so kind of like a diamond, um, but you've got A and B, okay? So they can take on all three of these different uh, crystal structures, and whether it takes on rock salt or sphalerite has to do with how ionic the chalcogenide is. Okay, so in the case of cadmium oxide, you've got the most electronegative uh, chalcogenide there. And so that material is a lot like cadmium two plus oxygen two minus. Whereas cadmium telluride is a more covalent substance because it, tellurium is not as electronegative. And so um, cadmium oxide takes on a rock salt crystal structure because uh, it's the potential energy that it can gain uh, is much larger. So the, the Madelung potential is larger for rock salt than it is for sphalerite. Wurzite is intermediate, and that tracks very well with the ionization energy of the, uh, of the chalcogenide that's present here. So if you have a substance that can take on multiple different crystal structures, you know, whether it takes on a, uh, um, uh, the type of crystal structure that it prefers to take or the energy differences between them can be traced to this Madelung potential. Rock salt is the best case scenario for an ionic material, which is why things like sodium chloride sit in that structure as opposed to one of these other ones. So the ionicity of the bonding determines the crystal symmetry, which is a um, pretty interesting observation. All right, <clears throat> now let's, con let's consider um, what that does to the energetics. Ethan, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, just a really quick question. Um, how big does the crystal have to be before the, like you can basically stop ignoring further terms? Um, I don't know how it changes with distance, but I, I would guess, you know, once you get beyond like five, the fourth or fifth nearest neighbor, it tends to zero, but I'm, I'm not really sure. Okay. So like even beyond like really small crystals, it's basically constant. Yeah, I think that that's probably true. 
you know, a crystal that's a thousand atoms or so is about, um, you know, if it's a spherical thing, it's less than 10 atoms across. So, you know, that's, you know, once, once you get beyond a thousand atoms, it basically looks like the bulk, at least at the middle of the crystal. <laughs> okay, gotcha. All right. Um, so let's think a little bit about how this relates to uh, band gap and um, that sort of thing. So here's the made along potential for rock salt crystal. It turns out that this Coulomb energy is about nine electron volts. How big is nine electron volts? Um, that is a deep UV, really a sort of a low energy X-ray. Um, it would give you a burn uh, if you were exposed to 9 EV photons. Um, so that's way outside of the visible. This is a huge Coulomb energy, okay? Um, let's compare those to the ionization energy and the electron affinity uh, of sodium and chlorine. So I've plotted here the ionization energy, which is the energy to pull an electron off of the sodium atom in the gas phase. This gives us a gas phase cation and a, an electron uh, with no kinetic energy in vacuum. Um, that ionization costs about 5 eV. If you take a chlorine, neutral chlorine atom in the gas phase, and you give it an electron to make a chloride anion, uh, it turns out that also, uh, uh, let's see, did I get that right? Uh, I think I might have the sign of this wrong here. I do this right? Well, the sum of these two uh, actually gives you a process that's uphill by 1.7 EV. So this, I feel like the sign of this thing needs to change. So um, it turns out it actually costs energy to pull an electron off of a sodium atom in the gas phase and put it on a chlorine atom in the gas phase. I, I find that really very illuminating. Uh, you know, you're used to thinking about sodium and chlorine being very reactive toward one another, you know, huge differences in electronegativity. Um, but this reaction of electron transfer does not, it's not favorable if you take two isolated sodium and chlorine atoms in the gas phase. Um, probably one of the most useful principles and rules, especially when looking at calculations um, to remember is that separated charge, unsolvated charge, without any kind of dielectric medium or out without any counter ions is very, very energetically unfavorable. If you take those sodium and chlorine ions and let them get close to each other, huge amounts of energy are released, okay? Um, things like hydroxide anion, in the gas phase, that's one of the strongest gas phase bases, more basic than butyl anion, because there's nothing on which to put the charge. Hydroxide is just, you know, O2 minus with a proton. Uh, butyl is a larger molecule, and the ions can sort of electrons and, and whatnot can rearrange. That stabilizes that ion substantially compared to hydroxide. So keep your eyes out for people separating charges in the gas phase or even separating ions in solution. Okay, those are uh, tend to be very, very costly things to do. So it's uphill to take an electron off of a sodium atom in the gas phase and put it on a chlorine atom in the gas phase. So you know that sodium chloride is very, very stable. Okay, so where does that come from? Well, it's all about the Madelung potential. It's not the only thing, but it's mostly about Madelung potential. Okay, so it's uphill to transfer an electron from sodium to chloride, but then if you take those ions and you form a rock salt crystal out of them, you get 16 electron volts of energy. Now, not, it's not quite 16 electron volts. This is what it would be if the material did not undergo polarization. Okay, so this is a calculation 
that does not include polarization. This is just a Coulomb energy calculation. But in that crystal, the atoms polarize. Okay, and that helps to reduce that energy slightly. There's also some covalent bonding that's going on in sodium chloride. You don't tend to think about that, but yeah, there's real covalent bonding. There is orbital overlap in that material system, and that leads to the development of bandwidth. Okay. The result is a material that has, an elect that has a band gap of about 90 B. And, uh, you know, so, there, so that each of these things contribute um, to the electronic structure of the sodium chloride. Most significantly, uh, the Coulomb forces associated with formation of a lattice of ions. Um, that is really what is uh, calling the shots here for sodium chloride. Um, let's see here. Um, right, bandwidth is about orbital overlap. Polarization reduces the potential of that charge. That's sort of an effect of the dielectric constant. So high dielectric constants are going to modify this energy substantially. Um, and uh, one last thing, just we already talked about this, but why is the bandwidth here and here so very different? Anyone? No one? Come on, why is the bandwidth so, what does the bandwidth tell us? The amount of orbital overlap? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, orbital overlap function that spreads the highest energy combination and the lowest energy combination. And why would that be different for this band and that band? What are the orbitals composing this band here? P orbitals. Which atom is responsible for them? Who owns the electrons in sodium chloride? Chloride. Oh, chloride. Chloride owns the electrons in sodium chloride, right? Because there's a lot more electronegative. So if I were to say, all right, these electrons, they're sitting in chlorine orbitals right? Because chloride owns the electrons. These orbitals are empty. Whose orbitals are empty? Sodiums, right? It's like sodium plus chlorine minus. So why does sodium have a wider bandwidth than chloride? Is it because they're S orbitals? Yes. And S orbitals have better overlap than P orbitals? That's right. S orbitals are better for bonding than P orbitals. P orbitals are better for, bond for bonding than D orbitals. D orbitals are better for bonding than F orbitals. So if you're ever looking at the bandwidth of a material and you see something that's really flat, it might be made of F orbitals, okay? Because F orbitals don't really bond very well. Or if you know that you have an F orbital system or a D orbital system, you know, if you look at the bands of that material and you see a flat one that's not very broad, that's probably composed of those orbitals that have poor overlap. If you see a band that's really broad, probably involves S orbitals, okay? So the width of the band tells you about the type of the orbitals and the strength of the overlap. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah. So for, on a previous slide, I remember that we had one where they were like really sharp, not broad. Yes. Like, and some of those were S orbitals. Is that because they're like not the valence orbitals? How does that work? That's right. So if you have one S orbitals in sodium chloride, you've got a one S on sodium and a one S on chlorine. There's no overlap because those orbitals are tiny compared to the separation of the atoms in the crystal. So there's no one S, one S interaction. Or there's no one S, four S interaction. 1s is this little tiny thing 
that's stuck to the nucleus and is not overlapping with anybody else. So it's really only the valence orbitals that undergo bonding. Uh, and so the core levels are not broad at all. Okay, good question. All right, so let's look again here at the lattice energy. Um, so we're gonna do this uh, thermal chemical cycle shown in the blue box over here. You've got sodium and chlorine atoms in the gas phase. We're gonna transfer an electron from sodium to chloride. And then we're gonna look at the amount of energy released when you put the sodium and the chloride back together again. Okay, has anybody ever seen, there's a wonderful demo uh, by this guy from UC Berkeley. He's the lab uh, instructor there. Um, and he, he burns molten, molten sodium in chlorine gas. His name is Lonnie. He takes a, a little um, scooper, puts a chunk of sodium in it and melts it. And then he dips it into a large cylinder full of chlorine and it goes off like gangbusters. And it's spraying all kinds of stuff in there and there's lots of light spewing out of it. And then he pulls it out and he, he tastes it <laughs> afterward. <laughs> That's great. He's, a, he's a, quite a character. Um, it's not downhill to transfer electrons from sodium to chlorine. Unless you're making a crystal. Okay. So all of that energy that's spewing out of there, sound and light and heat, the fireball that forms is because of that lattice enthalpy. Okay. It's the lattice energy that makes that feasible. All right, so I've shown here this thermochemical cycle in terms of the individual steps I diagrammed earlier. Pulling an electron off of sodium costs 5 EV. Putting an electron onto chlorine um, gives back uh, 3.6 electron volts. The sum of those is actually uphill uh, by the difference, uh, 1.5 EV. But then when you drop down to make sodium chloride solid, you get out all of this lattice energy, okay, 8.17 is the lattice energy. So that's the uh, energy released on bringing together those ions. Um, it includes the things like the polarization and whatnot uh, uh, that we diagrammed in the previous slide. Now, when you think about this, um, this lattice energy is very sensitive to the ionization energy and the electron affinity of the atoms, but it's mostly about the Coulomb potential. Um, and so if you look at the lattice energies that you see over here, you can understand the differences between these numbers, which are in electron volts, um, based on primarily based on the metalung potential. All right, so let's do lithium fluoride to iodide here, and lithium to potassium fluoride here. All right, so uh, think for a moment about why the number goes down when you go from lithium fluoride to lithium iodide, and why the number goes down when you go from lithium fluoride to potassium fluoride. Anybody want to explain why, explain this trend? And your atomic distance increases, so your coulombic energy decreases, so your lattice energy goes down. Yeah, so that's one of the possible explanations that the separation between the ions is changing here because fluoride and iodide have a different size. So the lattice constant is growing as you go from fluoride to iodide. What's another explanation? possible explanation. Electron affinity of going from fluorine to iodide. Yeah, so the, you know, fluoride to iodide, it's not as favorable to dump an electron onto the iodide, so that means the energy goes down, right, for doing that electron transfer. But when you look at the top row, lithium to potassium, the energy really should be going the other direction if uh, the electron affinity were, were, were driving the bus here, okay, and it's not. So the change in the electron affinity and ionization energy is an important factor, but not nearly as important as the size of the lattice. 
Okay, so if you're making a crystal, the smaller the ions, the more that crystal wants to form, the less soluble the material uh, tends to be. Okay, this is one of the reasons why um, doing alkyl lithium chemistry or aryl lithium chemistry in the presence of carbon fluorine bonds is very dangerous. This is a common cause of injury in a chemistry lab. People take carbon fluorine bonds and they do some reduction chemistry with lithium or sodium or potassium or aluminum, or they do lithium halogen exchange or whatever, and they provide a mechanism to form lithium fluoride. And you get a fireball, okay? So carbon fluorine bonds um, in the presence of lithium and potassium and sodium are dangerous, very dangerous. And it is very common to have uh, accidents this way. I once tried to deprotonate trifluoroethanol with uh, sodium hydride at minus 80 degrees. Okay, so I cooled some sodium hydride to minus 80 degrees and I added a drop of trifluoroethanol to make hydrogen gas and sodium trifluoroethoxide. And it got red hot and then burst into a black ball of soot. This is under argon at minus 80, okay? You should be very careful with carbon fluorine bonds and when you have the chance to make metal fluorides because the energy released is tremendous. Now, let's look down at the, the row below. Magnesium chloride, magnesium oxide, strontium oxide, alumina, scandium nitride, and think about what these numbers are due to. How do you explain these trends here? Anyone? I think it's the uh, number of charge of separation, right? Yeah, it's the charge of the ions. So, you know, magnesium is two plus. Okay. So that raises the metalung potentials by a factor of two. Um, and now when you've got a two minus and a two plus, you've raised the potential again by another factor of two. So these are about four times higher than the metal halide series above. Sorry, the magnesium oxide, strontium oxide, they're about four times higher than these numbers, right? These numbers are about twice what these numbers are. And it's just because the charge is greater. We've got two plus and one minus, two plus and two minus. Look at scandium nitride and alumina. Boom, those are big numbers. 159 electron volts, wow. Okay, um, you know, it's amazing that aluminum metal is stable in air. Huge driving force to make alumina. Aluminum foil sits there on the bench top, you know, in your kitchen cabinet, no fire. But wow, there's a lot of energy that could be released if you could oxidize it. So alumina itself is very, very stable substance, protects the underlying metal, um, partly because of the strength of its lattice, okay? So that's one of the most thermodynamically stable substances on earth. <laughs> and that's why the planet is made of it. <laughs> okay, so um, again here, you, know, you can calculate the energy of the lattice simply by the charge. Uh, and then also consider the size of the ions. Uh, things like solubility and, and all of that uh, are related to that. So that's a really useful principle to have in your mind. Made along potential, lattice energy of ionic things is uh, very powerful stuff. Let me check and see the time here. Okay. All right, so we're gonna put away some of these concepts. Um, you know, when you have a, a, an ionic substance or a covalent substance, you get these bands and they're composed of orbitals 
um, uh, that you might expect. You know, the filled ones are typically the anions in a crystal, if it's a uh, ionic crystal. The empty ones are associated with the cations in the crystal. You want to make a guess about the the bottom of the valence band, which is kind of like the LUMO, sorry, the bottom of the conduction band or the empty band, which is kind of like the LUMO of the material or the top of the valence band, which is kind of like the HOMO, it's not too hard to guess. You just think about which valence orbitals are being contributed by the partners and um, you, can, you can take a pretty good stab at what are the orbitals involved uh, uh, at the band edges. Um, Orbital overlap gives you band width, right? Um, right. Guessing the band gap directly is a little bit harder than just looking at the ionization energy and the electron affinity. Um, you know, like we've been talking about, you know, we looked at zinc sulfide and zinc telluride and said, oh, well, the valence band moves because the um, uh, electron affinity of the uh, chalcogenide is changing. So you can predict that. But it's slightly more complicated than that because of polarization effects and um, also because of the magnitude of the overlap between the elements involved. Um, but anyway, that's a sort of second order uh, consideration. Biggest determiner of the band gap um, in ionic solids is the metalung potential by far, okay? That's a massive uh, force. Coulomb potentials are a big deal. Um, what are the features of a solid that dictate the strength of the metalung potential? The size of the ions involved, so the separation of the ions, the charge of the ions, and lastly, the polarizability, okay? The dielectric constant of the medium and the polarizability of the solid is a very important feature uh, when determining things like the band gap. Um, right, and Ferroelectricity, I find this name very misleading because I think of magnetism when I see ferro. Uh, ferroelectricity is a polarization property of a solid. It's a, a, a ferroelectric is a material that has a stable off-center position in the crystal. Um, strontium titanate and barium titanate are classic ferroelectrics. Uh, the titanium moves in the octahedral volume from one side to the other and is stable in those positions. And that leads to this um, shape in the polarization curve that I showed you where there's kind of a barrier to moving. And that leads to very interesting uh, properties that people take advantage of. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about uh, how you probe the electronic structure of a material um, to better understand uh, these substances. So the, the classic way that people look at this kind of thing is with photoelectron spectroscopy. So you can take a solid and you can shine x-rays on it. The x-rays will collide with the atoms and they'll kick out electrons, okay? The, the electrons uh, or the atoms absorb the energy, electrons go flying out. And if you collect those electrons and you bend them with an electric field, uh, you can spread them out on a detector uh, and look at um, how much energy they left the sample with, okay? So the kinetic energy of the electron um, can be measured by how it's influenced by this uh, bending potential of the hemispherical analyzer. Um, and that, that kinetic energy tells you the hole from the depth of the well from which that electron came, okay? Because the kinetic energy is just the difference between the energy that was in the X-ray that came in and collided with that electron and how tightly it was bound in the first place. If it's bound really tightly, then you use up most of the energy of that photon to get it out. And it comes out with very little kinetic energy. If it's very, very weakly bound, most of the energy in that photon ends up as the kinetic energy in the electron. So if you measure the kinetic energy of the electron and you know the photon energy, then you can determine the binding energy, okay? Now, we usually know the X-ray energies, okay? They have very well-defined energies 
that are dependent upon uh, the X-ray source. Typical ones, aluminum, magnesium, copper, or synchrotrons. Okay, synchrotrons use a totally different X-ray generation mechanism, um, but you, know, you can get whatever you want at a synchrotron, aluminum, magnesium, and copper. Um, they give you lines. You probably remember looking at colorful lines in gen chem where they take a gas and they ionize it and you know you see specific wavelengths that it emits that tells you about the electronic structure this is the same thing uh, but now we're talking about core orbitals instead of valence orbitals and those energies tend to be in the x-ray uh, wavelength range all right um one little note here uh, the electrons that come out of the sample only come from the surface Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit about that um, here in a moment, but electrons scatter really easily. Okay, they're absorbed really easily. They collide with high probability. Uh, and so if you have any gas in the way between the sample and your hemispherical analyzer, the electrons are going to collide with the gas molecules and it's going to totally throw off their uh, kinetic energy measurement. And so these types of measurements are almost always done um, an ultra high vacuum to give you a pure measure of the kinetic energy that that electron left the sample with. Now it won't get out of the sample if it's coming from way down inside because the electron will collide on its way out. So this is a surface sensitive technique because only those surface atoms uh, um, produce photoelectrons. All right, so photoelectrons uh, that are produced by this process give you a measure of the binding energy. Um, it's important to understand that there's another principle here called the work function that comes into play. Um, and so I've diagrammed the valence band of a material here. These are the filled orbitals. Um, this I've shown you the Fermi energy. What's the Fermi energy? This is the, go ahead. 50% probability that an electron would be there. Yeah, and so that happens sort of at the highest energy, uh, you know, in the solid. It's not the highest energy. At zero Kelvin, it would be the highest energy. When you warm it up a little bit, some of these electrons get promoted. Um, and so there's this funny definition of 50% probability. Um, but, you know, it's sort of like the highest energy in the solid. Um, and so the buying energy is actually the difference between that Fermi energy and the orbital from which the electron is coming. Here, it's actually a core orbital that I've diagrammed. So the, the X-ray photon comes in and collides with this core orbital and pow, out goes this photoelectron. The photoelectron is way up here, well above the vacuum level because it has kinetic energy in vacuum, okay? And so the difference between this energy and this energy is the kinetic energy of the photoelectron. The binding energy is the Fermi energy in this core orbital energy separation. And then there's this other thing called work function. Okay, the work function is the difference between uh, vacuum and the Fermi energy, um, or it's the minimum energy required to remove an electron from a solid into vacuum. Okay, that's the work function. Um, yeah, so this is analogous to, you know, atomic photoelectron spectroscopy, which we've, you've talked about in Gen Chem. Um, you know, the difference, of course, is uh, that it's a solid. Uh, and so um, we have these other terms, binding energy and work function versus just the ionization potential. All right, so what is the binding energy? Binding energy is a measure uh, of the interaction between the electron and the nucleus. And it's very sensitive to the orbital, right? As you might imagine, the 1s orbital has a much higher binding energy than the 2s orbital because the 1s orbital is the smallest and closest to the nucleus. It has the greatest uh, interaction strength. Um, binding energy goes up with the nuclear charge, okay? So if you're going from sodium to potassium, to cesium, the 1s orbital energy, that binding energy is going to go way, way up because the nucleus has more and more and more protons associated with it. 
uh, and that leads to uh, much, much stronger forces there. So uh, let's think for a moment about how x-rays are made. Uh, I remember somebody quizzing me about this as I was learning to do um, x-ray crystal structures. You know, if you had to generate a source of x-rays, how would you do it? And it turns out that one of the best ways to do it um, is actually to look at the recombination of a hole generated uh, in an atom with some of the other uh, energy levels in that atom. So if you take some solid, let's say aluminum, and you produce a hole in one of its core orbitals, very shortly, one of the other electrons above that hole will fall down. And the drop in energy that comes from recombination of an electron in the valence band with this hole in the core orbital produces an X-ray. Okay, this is, this is an X-ray energy. Uh, uh, and so, or this energy is equal to an X-ray. So if you can knock electrons out of core levels, you can make um, aluminum an X-ray emitter because the recombination of the valence band electron in that hole produces a photon. So here's a diagram uh, of an X-ray uh, tube. Okay, and what you've got here is a very hot filament. This filament is so hot that it's spewing electrons out. And there's this focusing cup around it that probably has some charge on it that sends those electrons uh, flying toward this piece of tungsten here. Okay. When the electrons collide with the tungsten, one of the things that they can do is to knock out electrons from core levels. And on doing that, you get recombination and X-rays come streaming off of this material. Okay. So there's usually a sort of protective window here. Um, uh, and uh, one sort of, sorry, there's a protective sheath around this thing because X-rays are very bad for you. Um, and there's a window uh, where some of those X-rays can come streaming out. Um, let's see, what else do I have to say about that? Yeah, that's about it. Um, so depending upon the substance that you put on this, um, into this device, you get different separation between the core levels and the valence band in that material. So I told you just a moment ago that the 1S and the 2S and the 3S are all of different binding energies you know, the absolute energy of those core levels compared to the Fermi energy in that material is different. And so if you take a magnesium and aluminum, zirconium, silver, titanium, and chromium uh, uh, X-ray source like this, the recombination event produces X-rays of different characteristic energies. And they're given these names K and L um, or M uh, alpha. So like magnesium K alpha, is a standard type of an X-ray that people use. The K refers to the fact that the, the orbital level that the hole was created in uh, is an S orbital, a 1S orbital, okay? An L, so a, a zirconium L alpha radiation comes from a 2S or a 2P level. Uh, less often, you'll see M in there. The alpha and the beta, um, is a nomen is a, uh, uh, a spin orbit indicator. So each of these different materials has characteristic um, binding energies or ionization energies for those orbital levels, and you get X-rays out that are approximately equal to that. Let's see here. I guess I can keep going. All right. So now you have an X-ray source. This X-ray source has a certain energy associated with it that comes from the depth of the core level, from the hole that you created in this X-ray tube. Um, and those X-rays can be shined on a sample of interest. Uh, here's an example of a photoelectron spectrum of titanium dioxide. Um, and income X-rays from our, uh, I don't know what this was taken with, let's say it's aluminum K-alpha radiation. Uh, or copper uh, K-alpha radiation, those X-rays come in 
and they will collide with all of the various orbitals in this substance. There are many different energy levels in the substance. The X-rays can promote electrons from any one of those levels into vacuum, as long as the X-ray has uh, enough energy or more energy than the binding energy and the work function put together. Okay. So when you look at this um, spectrum here, over here on the right is zero, zero binding energy. That would be um, the Fermi energy of the material. Um, and then you go to the left and you get these spikes. Notice the, the x-axis here is in electron volts. And we're going from zero to 800 electron volts. <laughs> these are very large energies, right? But that's how much energy you need to get an electron out of a titanium 2s orbital. That's the depth of a 2s orbital. Five and a, 550 electron volts below the Fermi energy, way, way down there. Okay, so all of these levels can be ionized by the X-ray that comes from whatever the source of the uh, X-rays is, aluminum K-alpha radiation, which I think has an energy of about 1,500 electron volts. So the difference between the kinetic energy of the photoelectron and that X-ray energy is the binding energy. And each one of these peaks that you see here is characteristic of the elements in the sample. Now, these are very well-known energies. The core orbital energy, you know, the oxygen 1s level is not very easily modified, <laughs> okay? And it doesn't move very much if you do modify it, right? We're talking about this thing being 550 uh, electron volts down relative to, to vacuum or whatever. Um, and, you know, that's a huge amount. So you're not going to modify it. The result is that elements have very well-defined photoelectron spectra with characteristic signals. It's like a fingerprint, you know? You take a photoelectron spectrum of something and you find a peak at 290 EV, you know it's carbon because there's nothing else that appears at 290 EV. Now, I don't know that that's specifically true, but that's the, that's the idea here, okay? Sometimes elements do have overlapping spectra, but there are actually multiple peaks associated with a given element. Uh, and so you can kind of look at the collection of those and determine what is present in your sample. If somebody ever says, hey, I've got this stuff, I need to figure out what it is. This is the easiest way to go take a stab at what kinds of elements are present. You put it into a photoelectron uh, spectroscopy tool and you get this signal out. All right, so um, core levels have these really nice sharp peaks. Uh, valence band levels, conduction band levels uh, don't have such nice sharp peaks. Um, they appear at well-known energies that can be used to determine elemental composition. Um, the other part about this uh, pattern here is that look at the baseline. What is going on with the baseline? It's like a staircase kind of. And it seems to happen right after you start ionizing titanium 2p here. There's one after this carbon 2s, after these 3s and 3p levels. So what's going on with the background? The background actually comes from electrons that don't make it out cleanly. Okay. They're scattering. Some of the photoelectrons don't have these well-defined energies because they're not uh, making it cleanly to the detector. Um, I think I'm going to stop here before trying to get into talking about all that. All right. Uh, does anybody want to ask a question at this point? Why are there two titanium 2p peaks? Um, so there, there is spin orbit effects 